The Buddha once said that all he taught was suffering or dukkha and the end of suffering. But there are people who came to him with questions about things that were not related to that problem. In cases like that, he would put the question aside. And the reason he illustrated with a story of a man who's shot with an arrow, and they go to the doctor. And the man says, before you take the arrow out, I want to know who shot the arrow, what wood the arrow was made of, what feathers it was made from, questions of that sort. And the Buddha said, if he demanded to have the answers to those questions first, he would die. In that particular case, what has to be done is take the arrow out. And then you decide if you really need to know about the wood or the feather or the person who shot you. In the same way, when you ask questions that have nothing to do with the end of suffering, you're delaying your cure, because we'd all suffer. And if we're going to place conditions on the answer beforehand, before we accept the treatment, we just keep pushing the treatment further and further away. And you could die first. So we focus on the questions that are really necessary. And it's good to know, though, the questions that are not necessary, the questions that are like the question of who shot the arrow. One of those questions is, well, what am I? Do I have a self? Do I have no self? The Buddha consistently refused to answer those questions. He said once that it would get you entangled in a tangle of views if you try to answer the question. Another time he said that it would actually get you into wrong views. And any way you define yourself, he said, is to place limitation on you. We define ourselves by our attachments. And then our attachments, he said, the way we define ourselves places a limitation on us. So we're here to get rid of the limitations. So we don't try to answer questions that would place limitations on us. Because you think about that question, do you have a self, do you not have a self? If you believe that you've got a self someplace inside, then you're going to be looking for something you can hold on to. And that gets in the way of the practice, because ultimately we have to let go of everything. If you believe there is no self, then you can ask, well, who is responsible for the actions? And who's going to reap the results? Maybe it doesn't really matter what happens. There's nobody responsible, nobody to be punished or harmed by the actions. So you just do what you want. So in that case, teaching that there's no self can make you very irresponsible. Some people ask the question, well, maybe it's something that you would say that in one sense you have a self and in another sense you don't have a self. But that doesn't avoid the problem. Whatever you believe is self, you can hold on to. What the Buddha was more interested in is this action of creating a sense of self. What does that do? How is that helpful in the path, and how does it get in the way? And those are questions you can answer, because there are times when having a sense of self that is competent to do the practice, in other words, you feel that you can do this, and it will take responsibility. In other words, if you see that what you're doing is harmful, you decide to stop the harm and then do what you can not to repeat it. And then finally, that you're going to benefit from this practice. If you create that kind of sense of self, that's useful. And you keep using it until you don't need it anymore. You regard it as a tool. But you want to be very clear that, about the fact that this is something that you're creating. It's an action. And as always with the actions, the question isn't, what is your true self, what is not your true self? The question is, is this a skillful action or is this not a skillful action? Sometimes, especially in Thailand, we hear that well, you don't have a self, but you are the five aggregates. But then again, that's defining what you are. And again, it's placing a limitation on you. If you're just the five aggregates, well, the five aggregates are going to end at Nibbana. Does that mean you don't exist anymore? Well, no. The Buddha said when someone reaches Nibbana, you can't say that they do exist or don't exist or both or neither. And again, that's because you can't define them. 
they're defined by their attachments. And when they have no attachments, there's no definition. When there's no definition, you can't talk about them. All we need to know is that unattaining nibbana, there is the highest happiness. And as John Swart once said, once you've attained the highest happiness, you don't care to even answer the question of whether there's somebody there or not. It's just totally irrelevant. So what this means is that you want to get very careful about watching your mind in action when you latch on to something. Is it a good thing to latch on to or not a good thing to latch on to? We hold on to the path, the same way that we hold on to a raft going across the river. Or another analogy the Buddha gives is the path is like a chariot. You ride in the chariot, you can't let go of the chariot because you fall off. So hold on to the chariot. And when it gets you to your destination, then you get down, let go. So you will have to hold on to certain things, and the things you hold on to will define you. But you're not so much interested in your definition of you. You're more interested in the question of these actions in my mind. Are they causing stress or are they not causing stress? Some things cause stress and they don't really accomplish anything, so why bother? Other things may cause stress, like practicing right now. Even though we're trying to get the mind to rest, it is work. Because the mind keeps wanting to slip off. It's like a little child. You try to get it content to play, and it wants to find something else. But you want to make sure that it stays safe and stays in a safe place. You give it things to play with inside, so it doesn't go wandering off. So it is work. Whatever there's work, there has to be a sense that you are capable of doing the work, you are responsible for the work, and you will benefit from the work. That's all you need to know about who you are. Instead, you focus on the work that needs to be done. This is why when the Buddha analyzed the causes for stress, there's no place in there where he says, someone does something. And simply he says, there is this action, and then there's that action, then there's this action, then there's that action. And if the actions are done in ignorance, there's going to be stress and suffering. If they're done with knowledge, they can become part of the path away from suffering. So you want to focus on the actions of the mind. This is where we get the mind really quiet, not to find out who we are, but to see exactly what actions are happening in the mind, which ones are causing stress, and which ones are helping put an end to it. So when we focus on the actions, we're not saying there's nobody there. We're just saying it's irrelevant right now. It's like when you talk to a physicist, and the physicist describes the, the atoms in a rock. And he doesn't say whether the rock is sandstone or granite or limestone. He's more interested in the electrons and the protons in the atoms. When he doesn't talk about limestone or sandstone. That doesn't mean there is no such thing as limestone or sandstone. It's just that for the time being, if you're looking just at the atom, the type of rock it is, how it got formed, those things are all irrelevant. You try to focus on what the problem is that you're interested in solving. And don't let yourself get distracted by other problems that can get in the way. So learn to treat that question of who you are as a problem that gets in the way. And instead, look at the question of what am I doing to identify with things? Because identification is a form of clinging. And clinging, as we know, is part of the definition of suffering and stress. So if you have any sense of you inside that's just purely clinging and it's not helpful in any other way, then you let it go. You try to find out what you were craving to create that clinging, see that the craving isn't worth it. That's how it ends. Other times you cling because you're clinging, say, to mindfulness or concentration. Okay, cling in the meantime, because that is the work that needs to be done. When the work is no longer needed, then you can drop that too. So whenever you get confused about the Buddha's teachings, keep reminding yourself, 
he taught just two things, suffering and the end of suffering. And then asked himself, how does this teaching fit in to solve that problem? And if we bring other problems to the practice, we have to learn how to put them aside. Otherwise, the arrow just stays in our heart. Nobody can get it out because we refuse to take it out. We've been waylaid by other questions. And as the Buddha said, once the arrow is taken out, the questions you wanted to have answered, you realize they don't really have any meaning anymore. Because you've solved the big problem, which is why it is that the mind wants happiness, but it keeps creating suffering and stress. You get so that it stops creating that suffering and stress. That's when you can put all your burdens down. <laughs>